December 1940. Captain America No. 1 has just been released. The Chicago Bears will set the most one-sided win in NFL history, 73-0 against the Redskins. Fire is clearly a theme. World War II rages across Europe. Flames spread through London, burning thousands of homes. And President Roosevelt holds his fireside chats, demanding that America become the great arsenal of democracy. The first of that same month would also see the birth of Jerry Lawson to two loving parents in Brooklyn, New York. His father was a longshoreman and his mother was on the PTA for public school 50, and Jerry grew up encouraged to experience and discover science. His grandfather was trained as a physicist, but blocked from any careers due to racial discrimination, and so Jerry grew up understanding that science had to be a passion. You could learn it yourself, you could love it, but it wasn't something to get into for money. It was purely about love. And love got him pretty far. Love got him into learning about engineering and ham radios. Ham being radio shorthand for amateur. Of course, you needed a license from the FCC to broadcast, so it seemed like this love would be cut short. But there was one convenient loophole. Jerry and his family lived in Jamaica, New York, in a federal housing project in South Jamaica, commonly called the 40s. And for residents of federal housing projects, you didn't need to get a license. So hanging his antenna out the window, Jerry built a radio station in his bedroom piece by piece over several months. In high school, he'd go to work after school as a contractor for various stores, repairing the televisions of their customers, and eventually he'd even go to college to study electronics. Both Queens College and CCNY, the City College of New York. He didn't get a degree, but he knew his stuff. It's safe to say that Jerry liked electronics. He did it as a passion as his love. He followed that passion into several companies like PRD Electronics and Kaiser Electronics, working on military projects. It was during this period of time that Jerry came up with what is now one of my personal favorite sayings, and I'll relay it to you in just a moment. See, he eventually quit doing those military jobs and moved into a freelance position with Fairchild Semiconductor. Now, you've probably never heard of this company, but at one point they were huge. They worked on the Apollo space missions. They co-invented the integrated circuit, and they were a huge producer of specialized semiconductor transistors. If that sounds like a strange company to bring up in a gaming sense, that is because of Jerry Lawson. See, during this period of time, Jerry had found a local club. Fairchild was based in Sunnyvale, California, just outside San Jose. And about 10 miles away was Menlo Park, just outside of a little town called Mountain View and Cupertino. Here, Jerry would go and meet with other electronics fanatics in a club called the Homebrew Computer Club, including several people who would go on to some notoriety. Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, George Morrow, and many others. This group is often blamed for, well, everything tech, and there are several films, books, and more written about it. And Jerry attended almost every single meeting. This helped motivate him to try something new. And he'd been using computers for some time, apparently even including one in his own garage, a nearly unheard of feat at the time. Around this time, a company called Syzygy was starting to make some waves with their arcade games, making a lot of money and creating a lot of buzz. Jerry met a couple of the guys from the company, Alan Alcorn, Ted Dabney, and Nolan Bushnell. And the issues that they were experiencing convinced him to try to fix some of them. In that same garage, he took what he'd learned 
the problem that Syzygy, now called Atari, had experienced and started playing around. He played a game called Computer Space from Atari, which itself was based on Space War for the PDP something I've talked about before, and decided to make a video game. Demolition Derby an arcade game credited as one of the first coin-operated arcade machines and one of the first microprocessor-driven games in existence. This side project eventually got around town, and as is common in any small group, it eventually got back to Fairchild. Fairchild approached Jerry and explained that they had a project with a small company called Alpex. Alpex had been working on a video game for Intel, and Fairchild wanted to see if they could get it to run on their processors. They came to Jerry because he was known for knowing about video games thanks to his little side project. During the project with Alpex, Jerry created a prototype video game console pitched it to the vice president of Fairchild, and got a budget and a division to make a full-fledged video game console. Here's where we get to my favorite quote from Jerry Lawson. Military was good training for consumer because consumer products actually have to be stronger than military. You may not think that's hilarious, but it is. His reasoning, of course, makes perfect sense. Customers are hard on products, they're dumb, and you can't train them one-on-one -on -one or fine them for breaking stuff. Consumer products have to be able to go live immediately and be reliable without any training, without any support staff, or else the product is a failure. Two engineers at Alpex, Wallace Kirshner and Lawrence Haskell, had developed an idea about removable media. They brought this idea to Jerry and his team, and Jerry cultivated it and refined it into what today you would call a video game cartridge. Something like you might put into your Nintendo Switch. This was the first time anyone had ever ever conceived of a removable video game cartridge, surprisingly, and Fairchild's console was going to be the first to have it. Jerry was the one to see how using a cartridge would eliminate problems. You could separate the console from the game. It meant that the end user could have a better experience, and this was important. Fairchild at the time was basically known for one thing, Comcast levels of bad support. The Fairchild console being easy and simple, and thus requiring no support from Fairchild, that was a huge selling point. And so video games that were separate from the console, they weren't hardwired in anymore. You could keep a console for years and buy new games to put into it. This was a revolution one with all the fun. The Fairchild Video Entertainment System at your larger JCPenney. The home entertainment system that never gets old. Plug in a new video cart and change the fun. Play tic-tac-toe, shooting gallery, or just doodle. Switch video carts and play Desert Fox. Switch again, it's Blackjack. Or play the two built-in games, Pro Hockey or Tennis Champ. Channel F for fun. The Fairchild Video Entertainment System. Just $169.95. Video cart cartridges, $19.95 each. At your larger JCPenney. The Channel F, or Channel Fun. That $169.96 would today, in 2020, be about $765. Not a cheap purchase by any means. $19.95 for the games? That's about $90 today. The Channel F would be a failure. Not a major failure, but a failure nonetheless. It was the first console to have AI enemies. It was the first console to have a pause function. And the controller, the jet stick, was one of the most popular controller designs for many years, even being ported to other systems. Many of the games at launch were rated very highly and represent archetypical video games that we see recreated even today. All of these functions are thanks to Jerry Lawson and his love for the work he was doing. But again, the Channel F would fail. 
It was too expensive, and many of the very highest quality games were the excuse. They required built-in onboard memory to help facilitate the games. And additionally, there was just a lot of expense altogether. It wasn't a cheap bargain, and it wasn't getting a lot of love from anyone else. Worse still, there was another product released just a year later. Attention shoppers, the new Atari cartridge game is in. Excuse me. Uh oh, George again. Ooh, Atari's air feedback. It comes with 27 games, but that's just for starters. You can get nine cartridges, 187 Ooh, games. Blackjack. <laughs> oh! I'd like an Atari. Sorry, only our demonstrators left. Mine! No, George. Mine. The new video computer system by Atari. More games, more fun. The Atari was the death knell of the Channel F, and soon Jerry would no longer work at Fairchild. He moved on to create his own company, Videosoft, which would work on 14 different games for the Atari 2600, for CBS, Mattel, Parker Brothers, and Amiga, though only one was released. Color Bar Generator, which as the name suggests, would generate color bars on the screen to allow for adjusting. It's unknown whatever could have happened, because shortly thereafter, the gaming industry would crash. The reason? Atari's console had no protection on their gaming cartridges, and too many bad games were made. The irony here being that the reason that Jerry Lawson retired from video games forever after gaining notoriety and credibility for creating the video game cartridge is that there were too many video game cartridges in the world. And so, Jerry Lawson retired from video games and closed Videosoft in 1984. And then he was completely forgotten about entirely. Until 2011, when a video game nerd was at a convention and heard someone buying Color Bar Generator from an old Atari game reseller and stopped to ask him why. This is Jerry Lawson. I'm originally from New York City, born and raised in California since uh, 1968. In the early 70s, I was involved in the development of one of the first computer programmable home video games. It's called the Fairchild Channel F. We used a microchip, which was produced by Fairchild Semiconductor, who employed me to produce a programmable video game. The process required the use of uh, cartridges. The each game cartridge, all games were put into a cartridge. We produced up to about 21 cartridges, some of which were a little unique in the market today. One was a, a chess game, footwork and blackjack game. Uh, we built the first precursor game to Pac-Man, which actually was a maze self-generating and computing maze that we went through to try to get from one side to the other. Uh, the game predates Atari by a year. Atari came out with their 2600, and we were one year ahead of them. We also had a unique hand Ladies controller. Ladies and gentlemen, in five minutes... This interview, and another performed later, would be shared online and seen by Joseph Salter, the chairperson of the International Game Developers Association's Diversity Advisory Board, on February 16th, 2011. Two weeks later, on March 4th, 2011, Jerry would finally be honored for his contributions to the industry that was, as of that date, worth over $16 billion. 27 years after being forgotten at the age of 70 years old, the formerly six foot six inventor, businessman, and pioneer, now crippled after losing a leg and an eye to diabetes, would finally be recognized as an industry pioneer. One month later, on April 9th, 2011, Jerry Lawson died in Mountain View, California, leaving behind his wife and two children. In 2018, at the San Francisco Game Developers Conference, the Jerry Lawson Award for Achievement in Game Development would be revealed.
And in 2019, the first one was awarded to Sierra McDonald, a senior program manager for the Xbox Advanced Technology Group. Today, you can find his papers in a collection at the Strong National Museum of Play in the International Center for the History of Electronic Games, which includes more than two dozen games, prototypes from the Channel F, design documents and blueprints, and even a copy of Color Bar Generator. Gerald A. Lawson, Jerry, is the father of the video game cartridge and therefore partially responsible for gaming as it is today. The idea that you could play multiple games on a single console without buying a new piece of hardware was revolutionary for the industry in both good and bad ways. Lawson's team not only helped usher in the ability for consumers to play multiple games on a single console, but also changed how the industry itself operated and thought of marketing and producing entertainment. He was a contemporary of Silicon Valley's super elites and a part of a pantheon of engineers and developers who set the stage and built the ground floor of my favorite hobby. He did this not for money or fame. Jerry grew up knowing not to do things to get rich, and he never expected to be famous. Jerry Lawson did all of this for love. Thank you for watching. My name is Moriarty. I'm one half of Crymore, and we'll see you on the next one.